Um, this is the party that espoused the Commonwealth that came into being in the 19, late 30s, 40s um, by Munoz Marin. Previously, it had been the Unionist, Federalist, slash Liberal Party that kept transforming and renaming itself. Uh, but the basic three positions really were these. Uh, the Nationalist Party that came into being in 1922. Uh, it has different names. Uh, had one name in 22 and then transformed itself into a different party name after the Commonwealth. But their position was always independence. Then um, those who wanted status quo, some self-rule, some autonomy, without disconnecting completely from the United States. Um, many incarnations, but the last incarnation of it was the PDP, which was the Munoz Marin Party, sort of social democrats, a kind of New Deal party, if you will, uh, in Puerto Rico. And finally, this is the little wrinkle, <laughs> Uh, the Republicans, who were always pro-United States and pro-statehood, who were supported by the Socialist Party that existed since 1912 and was the Worker Party, who supported statehood. The reason that the Socialists supported statehood was because they assumed that statehood would be the best deal for workers. For them, it wasn't about independence, not independence. Their focus was on the rights of workers. And they assumed that becoming a state would be the fastest, most efficient way of achieving that goal. This coalition between the Republicans and the Socialists allowed the Republicans to win elections during the 30s. Um, in an alliance, I think it was called La Alianza. Um, and one of the reasons that, that, as Al pointed out, there was a lot of violence during this period, it wasn't just because of the depression and economic dislocation, but because the Republicans, this Republican Party, pushed for Americanization, a return to English as the language that had to be spoken in the island, they really became, the more other alternatives appear, the more intractable they became. But they did all of it in alliance with the Socialist Party, which was sort of the unexpected wrinkle in the political map in Puerto Rico. Again, this is why sometimes to project our own understanding of how these parties line up from our own experiences is, is a fool's errand because the local politics played out in a tricky way. You, you had a question. I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. Who gets to vote? Is it the people in New York also? Oh, no. Vote? Well, at that, we're talking about the 20s and 30s, right? In 1920s, there were only about 10,000, let's say between 10,000 and 20,000 New Yorkers, uh, um, Puerto Rican New Yorkers. And it wasn't um, universal suffrage. Remember that part of the push um, by the American administration, starting with the Foreign Care Act, was to limit the amount of participation, um, which actually had been, in spite of the literacy rate being so high, people were used to participating in, in elections. Um, at that moment, it wasn't people who lived here who were voting. Now, you can vote on the island. You can vote for. If you're from Puerto Rico and you're living here now, you can vote in Puerto Rico for. Actually, in my, you know what? I have to, I have to check that because part of the wrinkle in this special citizenship arrangement that we have is that where you're in Puerto Rico, you cannot vote in American elections, right? But when you're here, you can vote in American elections. But if you are residing in New York, you are not residing in Puerto Rico, so you're not allowed to vote in Puerto Rico. This is the difference between being a country and not being a country. Dominicans, who are the second biggest community, Latino community, in Manhattan, their presidential candidates come to campaign in New York because they have dual citizens citizenship and they are allowed to vote in their own elections they vote here as Americans but they can also vote 
And if you think about how much money the Dominicans who live here send to their own country in remittances, they see themselves as being a constituency, right? And their presidents see them as a constituency. But Puerto Ricans only get to vote wherever they are. So if you are a Puerto Rican who lives here, you get to vote as any other American. You get residency in whatever state you are. You vote in the elections in that state, right? This is how Puerto Ricans became a powerful constituency in New York politics, right? Because they decided to participate in New York politics and have representation, finally. But that meant that they wouldn't have representation over there. If they go back, they can, right? But you cannot vote in two states, right, here. That would be fraud. Yes, Linda. Puerto Ricans who came to Florida mm -hmm. after the hurricane, who I think most of whom were hoping to go back to Puerto Rico eventually. And haven't been able to, more. right. Okay. But once they come, are they, do they have to have a residency requirement? They have to, no, no, they have to register like anybody who like moves, anybody like any American who moves from one state or another. Like when I moved from New York to DC, I had to get rid of my, D, my New York driver's license, it hurt. Um, and, uh, and then I registered to vote. Actually, I didn't register to vote until I became naturalized, but yes. But yes. So considered Puerto Rican. Yes. And their children who were born here are not considered Puerto Rican. But they're Americans. I mean, this is the thing, right. But I mean, how do they count who's Puerto Rican? If you're here, you're American. If you're there, you're Puerto Rican. If you're here, you're a New Yorican. <laughs> you're, sorry, if you're here, you're Jennifer Lopez, pretty much. <laughs> how did, uh, how or we Americans wish. How many Americans and Cubans come to the U.S. do they have to get naturalized? Who? Dominicans and... Yes, because they're foreigners. That's what, that's yep, okay. absolutely. I mean, this is, the, this is the wrinkle, right? We tend to put all of the Caribbeans in one boat and think of them as coming through the same process. But they didn't. And they do not function in the same way. And this is what it... But in the mind of most Americans, Puerto Ricans aren't Americans. They are seen as immigrants. They were treated as immigrants when they arrived in New York. I mean, that is why West Side Story is West Side Story, right? Because they are seen as a group of immigrants that came and changed the culture of New York. Yes? There's another wrinkle. I worked as a caseworker in the welfare department in New York City, and there was competitions between Puerto Ricans and blacks. Yep. The blacks see Puerto Ricans coming in, taking what was deservedly theirs. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, this, the, the, the hierarchy of, of groups that see themselves as disadvantaged and then are discriminated against and are equally discriminated against uh, was definitely an issue. The biggest issue that Puerto Ricans had when they, when they came in mass in the 50s had to do with previous waves of immigration. Although for Puerto Ricans, this was some sort of internal migration, really, because they were Americans, right, that allowed them to come. It was basically a new immigrant group, right, adding to, to the texture of that patchwork of immigrant groups that exist in New York City in different neighborhoods, right? Um, so I want to talk quickly about the nationalist movement, and this is a painting of Pedro Albizu Campos, uh, who was the, although he wasn't the person who founded the Nationalist Party, he was the person who made it the important force that it would be and the radical force that it would be. Um, he began leading the Nationalist Party in the 1930s. Um, he was very active in trying to create a different kind of dynamic, political dynamic in the island, confronting um, those who advocated for statehood, um, those who were happy with the status quo. 
As I said, in the 30s, the fight with the nationalists became much more um, pitched than it had been before, precisely because you had um, the statehood Republicans pushing for more and more Americanization, and that created this polarization with, um, with the nationalists. Um, he targeted the universities. Um, he was seen as a troublemaker. He was a troublemaker, uh, but with a purpose, obviously. Uh, he was accused of conspiring against the United States government. He was imprisoned in 1936. Uh, after he and other nationalists were convicted of being associated, associated with Riggs' murder, um, Colonel Francis Rigg, who was killed in 1936 uh, after a massacre in one of the universities. Then um, in 1937, the Ponce massacre happens. And Ponce, during, the Ponce massacre is really a march that was done exactly a year or so after um, Campos was imprisoned. It was on Palm Sunday. Uh, they had a permit. Supposedly, they had a permit, although in reality, they didn't need a permit for the march. Uh, a confrontation ensues between the police and the march. Uh, the police had been sent there by Governor Winship that they didn't want the nationalists marching. Um, Violence happens, shooting happens, 200 people were hurt, um, 19 end up dead, two of them policemen. And then immediately afterwards, there is a cover up by the police saying that the shooting really began by the nationalists, that there had been sharpshooters on the sides of the street who were the ones who started with um, the violence and the shooting. Um, afterwards, a commission. Uh, Civil Rights Commission was created by Congress to investigate what happens, what happened uh, in Ponce, and they pointed the finger at Winship, uh, found him responsible for the deaths uh, and those who were hurt, but nothing ever happens. Winship finally stops being <laughs> the governor of Puerto Rico in 1939, but no one went to jail for the murders that happened, and Campos continued to be imprisoned. Um, this is another... Um, Another link that I'm going to send to you, this is from The Village Voice that created a cartoon version of colonial history of Puerto Rico. And each sort of slide has a different episode in Puerto Rican history. And I figured I would use two today, one for Operation Bootstrap um, in the Commonwealth and the other one for Pedro Albizu Campos. So um, you see this is sort of the narrative that that those who believe in the nationalist cause and the cause of independence have uh, regarding the Ponce massacre. Um, in 1934, he becomes um, the head of the party. In 1936, he's arrested. And in March 21, 1937, a march pretend, uh, protesting his imprisonment was attacked by police, leaving uh, 19 civilians dead. Uh, dead, and this was known as the Ponce massacre. And it's really the most uh, violent um, deadly act uh, uh, against um, islanders during this period. Um, though it is important to note that a year later, Governor Winship, who had a tenure, decides that he's going to celebrate the invasion of, the Port of Puerto Rico. And usually this happened every year, but it happened in San Juan. The year, in 1937, he decided he was going to do in Ponce, where the massacre happened a year, late, a year earlier. And nationalists attempted to assassinate him. It was the first time that uh, an, a governor was, um, there was an attempt on the governor's life. Um, he survived, but 36 people were wounded, including a nationalist uh, member of the National Guard and a nationalist guardman. Um, the other violence, which is what I'll refer to earlier, is also done by the Nationalist Party, but comes in the context after the Declaration of the Commonwealth. And as a reaction of the Declaration of the Commonwealth in 1950, there was an attempt on Truman's life. And then in 1954, uh, an attack on Congress. I think it was 10 congressmen who were shot 
the nationalists went into the hall of Congress of the House of Representatives and started shooting at congressmen. So this is a pretty violent act um, that is part of this history of how to define the status and identity of the United States and that we don't really talk about a lot or we don't know about. Yes? In 1954, was that in Washington, D.C. or yeah. Puerto Rico? No, 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 it was here. It was right here. I, again, um, there is some footage of that, not from within the House of Representatives, but from outside. I will send it to you guys. I, I, try, I, I was trying not to show a lot of graphic stuff because we will be overloaded with some graphic stuff uh, during the hurricane. So, yeah. Truman, Truman was in the U.S. Yes, Truman was in the U.S. when the attempted assassination. These two, I think of them as separate campaigns, really because this, this happens in the United States. These attempts happen in the United States and they take place as a reaction to the declaration of the Commonwealth, right? Um, it's almost like the nationalists, they renamed the party, they had to adapt to the change in conditions and political conditions on the island and part of that was to shift the strategy of where, where their actions, their violent actions would have more um, make more noise or more impact, and doing it here would have more impact, right? Um, doesn't mean that they were not punished or mistreated um, in the island. As we read about how, what happens to them in the 1970s, they were, I mean, they were targeted by the FBI um, in the 1970s in the context of the Cold War, because although they were nationalists, usually, it was the Cubans who at the UN, on behalf of the nationalists, used the decolonization statement every year to put Puerto Rico in evidence against the United States. Yes? The officers who were killed at Ponce, they were caught in their own crossfire, weren't they? Well, because I don't think that No, I mean, this is, this is, this is, If you read the nationalist version, the nationalists didn't have guns that day. And the version of the arm, the nationalist with the arms is part of the cover up. And they were shot by friendly fire, right? 200 people were injured that day because they were shooting into a protest on the street and shooting goes astray. Um, there is the official version from Governor Winship, then there is the nationalist version, and then there's the Hayes version, which is the commission which blamed Governor Winship for creating the situation, but took a sort of um, agnostic view on who had the guns and who didn't have the guns, uh, but blamed Winship for creating the situation and sending um, sending ar an armed contingent into what was supposed to be a peaceful march. So, um, okay, there's, when we think about what happens after Jones or in the context of the Commonwealth and the upper, uh, Operation Bootstrap, um, that really changed Puerto Rico forever. Um, there are two people who are crucial in, in, in this transformation. And one is Munoz Marin, uh, Luis Munoz Marin, who was the creator of the PDP, the political party that proposed the Commonwealth. And the other one was Rexford Tugwell, who served as governor of uh, Puerto Rico from 1941 to 1946. Uh, Tugwell had been an economics professor uh, and was a member of President Franklin Roosevelt's uh, brain trust. I think he had been um, Secretary of Health or Agriculture, he will come to me. Uh, and he had been much maligned by the press to the point that he had to be, had to be he was forced to resign. Uh, he was supposed to be named to some commission in New York, but instead he asked Roosevelt to send him um, to Puerto Rico as governor because he had very concrete ideas about what had to happen in Puerto Rico uh, and transforming Puerto Rico into a less colonial um, outpost for the United States. And it is 
one of those contingencies of history that you have two people in leadership positions who had very uh, detailed plans about what they wanted and had the power to make them happen. And this is how the Commonwealth and Operation Bootstrap happened. Um, here is uh, on the cover of Time magazine, um, Governor Munoz Marin. So as governor, Tugwell instituted land reform, reduced the powers of the presidentially appointed auditor and attorney general, and created a budget office and planning board, which had not existed in Puerto Rico until then, and laid the basis for the creation of an actual civil service. People who were experts who would serve Puerto Rico in government, regardless of who was in power. He also approved the 1942 law that created the Puerto Rico Development Company, the island's legislator, le, uh, legislature's first major initiative in economic transformation, uh, trying to push initiatives with um, private financing and public financing towards industrialization. Uh, Muñoz Martín, Marín had been the son of Muñoz Rivera. As I said, he had been lived abroad for many years, had been a journalist, um, came back, became president of the, um, of the Senate, uh, became a politician, abandoned the Liberal Party, created his popular Democratic Party um, in 1938, and then became the most popular politician uh, throughout the 1940s. One of the things that, um, that happened with the transformation of the economy on the island, as I said, when the Americans come in and at the turn of the century, 1920s, they transformed the economy into a monoculture economy, just sugar production. Anything that was industrialized was connected to sugar or had some connection to the sugar industry, but nothing else was happening economically on the island. This becomes a problem during the Depression, and I will talk about that in a minute, but one of the things that happens is that, that Monje Rios talks about in the book is that people would sell their vote to their employers because they were so disappointed by the politics of the island and by the terms under which they were ruled that it was easier to vote for whoever your employer wanted you to vote. And one of the things that the Popular Democratic Party did was campaign in not selling your vote. It was the, really the crux of their campaign, more than status, more than anything else was your vote matters, don't sell it. You own it, it's yours, vote for something that matters to you. And it really was a social democratic, sort of in the European sense, party that talked about economic development, the role that the state could have in economic development, and it was based on studies that had been done and commissioned by the government of the United States about the condition of the island because of the catastrophe during the Depression. That when the, when the, when the Depression happens, sugar, the price of sugar collapses because no one wants to buy it, right? And the, Puerto Rico is left without what to sell. The whole of the economy grinds to a halt. That's when you have the first biggish wave of immigration that is not the sort of trickling immigration that we saw in the 20s. And two studies were commissioned, and they both blamed the exclusivity of sugar production on the island for the degree of poverty. And based on that study, and what was the consensus at the time in Latin America, that you had to diversify your economy, that being the producer of primary products was a problem that left you at the mercy of the market. Munoz Marin begins to envision something that will lift the lives of those who worked in the countryside and change the economic dynamic of the country, together with social rights uh, and more self-governance. Um, 
again, we go back to this issue of politicians who present their politics in different ways. Muñoz Marin had been since the beginning of his political career. Um, he favored independence. But uh, for the 10 years that he was head of the Senate before he becomes the first Puerto Rican elected governor of Puerto Rico, he changed his mind. He believed that the relationship with the United States that Puerto Rico had, specifically the economic relationship, would benefit Puerto Rico, that the issue of status in a certain way was distracting Puerto Ricans from the real issue, which was their inability to sustain their economy and achieve economic have their economy thrive at a level that other countries in the Caribbean weren't thriving. Um, so he recommended, he and Tugwell began to recommend and push for the creation of this different status, which was translated as Commonwealth in, in, in English, but it was Estado Libre Asociado, which means a free incorporated state. It was squaring the circle. We will be incorporated, which is what territories used to be before be they became states, right? And, and gave them that magic designation in the Constitution. But they would be free and associated with the United States, not part of the United States, right? In Spanish, it was sort of a way of creating a designation that would satisfy most of the people on the island short of full independence, right? It hinted at possible statehood, gave autonomy, and didn't preclude necessarily that one day they would be independent, but gave them enough that they could sell it to the rest of the island, uh, to the rest of the political groups. But in translation, it became this designation that is British, and we talked about how the Commonwealth was the model for the autonomic uh, charter of, 19, of 1897. Uh, it became this idea of the Commonwealth, right? that they would have some degree of self-rule, but they would still be associated with the United States. Um, they, there were more maximalist bills that were presented in the US Congress that would have given Puerto Rico more self-regulation, more political rights, specifically the tidings Pinero bill, which was presented and killed and presented and killed many times in Congress. Um, first, it, might, it, passed the ha it passed the Senate, it was pulled out of committee, and then passed the Senate, then was sent to the House and passed the House, but that legislative year ended, and then the next year the House refused to put it on the floor to a vote. So these bills, again, echo of the Foraker Act, echo of the Jones Act, a lot of negotiating between the different um, factions within the Congress, with the American Congress, about how much to give Puerto Ricans. And the refrain that kept, that Munoz kept using to sell this to the American politicians was, don't worry guys, nothing is going to change. It will stay the same. Obviously, if it was going to stay the same, why was he pushing so much for it, right? Um, but the, all the things that they thought that they would get, in the end, the one thing that they got was the ability to elect their own governor. And the creation of the status of the Commonwealth, plus the creation of their own constitution. But their own constitution wasn't even their own constitution because American Congress had to approve it. It had specific chapters on Bill of Rights, which talked about economic rights and social rights, and American congressmen nixed that out of the Constitution. So even as they were becoming a commonwealth, they had to do away with many of the things that they felt were important, that were part of the Constitution, that were part of the process. They had to sort of sell it out. Um, 
And it was called Public Law 600, which created the Commonwealth, as I said, that language um, that, I, that Linda asked about before of the compact that was crucial for Puerto Ricans, that it was at the rank that was higher rank of a treaty. The other thing that was crucial for, for Puerto Ricans in this period, that they be consulted before any decision is made, that they had a right to decide what would happen to their future, that it shouldn't be up to the United States Congress or the United States President or a United States Commission if they were gonna be a state, if they were gonna be independent, or if they were gonna stay as a commonwealth. And this, during the 60s, Muñoz Marin, who was a lot of the new generation of Puerto Rican uh, politicians that came of age in the 1960s, had connections to the Kennedy administration. Muñoz Marin felt close to Kennedy. They debated many times to bring up the status, to bring up the status of where Puerto Rico would go. Unfortunately, Kennedy dies and nothing ever happens with that. But there is a referendum, a plebiscite, in 1967, and the Commonwealth wins. This is the story of Puerto Rico. Every time there is a plebiscite, people assume that statehood will win or independence will win. And until very recently, we'll talk about that next week, the Commonwealth, the status quo, always won because the island is truly divided in one third, one third, one third, and each third wants a different thing, right? Neither side has been able to really gain a leg up. Um, when in the 1990s, um, the new pro-statehood party, which is really sort of a reinvention of the Republican Party, um, with a young, very dynamic uh, governor, he felt that he had the pulse of the people because he had just won an election based on proposing a plebiscite. And the plebiscite happens a year after his election. And he was sure that in that statehood would win and statehood still lost. Always the, always the status quo. But there's a two track change that happens with the Commonwealth and economic changes on the island. And the big part of that is the creation, here we go, the creation of, um, of Operation Bootstrap. This is a table, unfortunately, when it's amplified like this, you can't really see it very well, but it lists every bill or law that was created um, for uh, Puerto Rico, organic law and law, um, and public law 600 that in the uh, elective government act that determined the future of Puerto Rican politics and the future of, of the status of Puerto Rico. The two studies that were done in the 30s that blamed the monoculture uh, for the economic crisis that led to the first wave of immigrants um, and the degree of poverty in Puerto Rico, one from Carlos Chardon in 34 and then Esteban Bird in 37. Um, the bootstrap, before bootstrap begins, and because we're running out of time, um, I'll just show you the tables and you'll get the words later, uh, the written words <laughs> later. Um, before bootstrap, really there was no industry in Puerto Rico. Uh, the needlework that I spoke about, which was complementary or supplementary to uh, work in the cane fields for dead time, it wasn't just women who would go and pick up a parcel and then would sew it at home and return it. Men sometimes also had to do it because they had to supplement their income. This is how families may do uh, in the seasonal work of sugar cutting. But this were uh, sort of individual contracts that were done through needlework. Uh, this wasn't a big industry. So when bootstrap begins, it's a transformation of the island as a whole. Um, if you look at um, employment in agriculture, you begin to see the numbers decrease. Yes. <laughs> you begin to see how the numbers begin to decrease. And 
in different things, tobacco, coffee, right? Um, and how non-agricultural work begins to go up. And here is another table from 1950 to 1965, and you can see how non-agricultural work begins to, begins to be a bigger slice of the economy. The thing, though, is that as the economy, the agricultural economy began to decrease and the industrial economy began to grow, the people who lived in the countryside began to move from the rural areas to the urban areas. They were now industrial urban cities that were being developed. The number of jobs available for the people who were abandoning the countryside were not enough. So that creates a sort of valve of people who come to the United States. The reason why you have West Side Story is because of bootstrap because agricultural work ceased to be a feasible line of work. The Puerto Rico as a country transformed itself from a mainly rural country to a more urban country. And as that migration from rural to urban, from agricultural work to non-agricultural work begins to happen, the number of jobs available for the people who used to do agricultural work, who used to live in the rural areas, the pace of job creation wasn't enough. But because they had somewhere to go. For $45, you could go to New York. And you were a citizen. And you didn't have to find papers or anything. You could come and work here and send money home. And you would be doing exactly the same work that you were doing before, needlework. You would come here and do textile work. It sweatshops, right? Sweatshop factories in New York City that paid very little money and tough hours. But it was money, and they were here while in Puerto Rico they had no source of income, no food, nothing. Here they had a community, and it transformed New York it, tr it created a culture, a new culture, the New Yorican culture, that was separate, related to Puerto Rico, but separate. And it transformed Puerto Rico itself. There were moments when there were more Puerto Ricans in the United States than Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico. So part of the deal, this is the crucial part, of how Operation Bootstrap happened is by giving a tax break to American companies that came to Puerto Rico. It was sunsetted, though. It was for a limited amount of time. So it was supposed to attract investment, attract know-how, sort of borrow industrialization from the United States to transform Puerto Rico. And then sort of once it took off, that tax break would end. When the tax breaks end, supposedly these companies would stay because they already had um, roots on the island and had a workforce. And do you guys want to guess what happened? Yep, they left. And they left a burden. Yep. The, it, it, we will talk next week about everything that went wrong with this plan, but at least in the 50s, 60s, and uh, 70s, this worked. The economy of Puerto Rico completely trans got completely transformed. Yes? What were the industries? Yes. I have an answer for that. Producers of textiles wearing apparel, footwear, electronics equipment, electric wiring, drafting tools, artists' brushes, fishing tackle, artificial flowers, and other plastic and metal articles assembled in Puerto Rico for uh, sale in the United States. A lot of it is what we call maquila today, assemblage, right? You would bring the parts. Initially, when it was needlework, only the materials would come with the design. And then the materials would be given to somebody with the design, and they would cut it and then return it. As this becomes an industry, 
it was mostly some production, but mostly assemblage. An interesting article that I don't know if you guys got to read that we won't get to cover today because we run out of time, um, but about how Puerto Rico develops its own foreign policy in the 1980s. And part of it, what they, they find themselves forced to develop their own foreign policy because Reagan pushes for the Caribbean Basin Initiative which pretty much extended all the benefits of being a free associated state, which Puerto Rico had, to everybody else in the Caribbean. So how was Puerto Rico now going to compete? The only thing that they had that was an advantage that no one else had was this, right? So how were they gonna compete? They created this scheme that was quite ingenious of calling it the twin plant plan that the plants where most labor intensive work would be done would be in the other Caribbean Basin initiatives that had a lower uh, education basis or that had not gone through this industrialization attempt that they had gone through and that Puerto Rico would finish off in services and other things. So in a way what Puerto Rico decided to do in the 1980s to deal with the Caribbean Basin Initiative was to sell itself as an outpost of the United States to the rest of the Caribbean Basin to help them become part of the Caribbean Basin. It was quite ingenious in a way of making lemonade out of lemons because when the leadership in Puerto Rico is faced with the likelihood that this Commonwealth thing is actually not gonna give them any benefits, <laughs> any leg up anymore in comparison to the rest of the Caribbean countries, they had to come up with a solution and they came up with a really ingenious one. That article, you should read it, it's the Sutton article, it's very short, it's like eight pages only. So, uh, yes, I know, I sent so much reading. So, um, here are the numbers for employment, unemployment, and participation rate plus out-migration. Um, and you can see half a million Puerto Ricans. Remember what, no what number did I give you for the 30s? 10, 20,000? By the 1970s, where there were half a million Puerto Ricans in New York. And you can imagine the kind of pressure that put in the dynamics in New York City between other groups that existed there. Um, I am, this is another cartoon, again, from the nation. I will send you the link to all of them. Um, the creation of the new Commonwealth of Puerto Rico coincided with the implementation of Operation Bootstrap, which transformed the island agricultural economy into an industrial one. While Bootstrap improved living standards for many, it depended on the export surplus of surplus labor to the U.S. By the 1970s, Puerto Ricans in the U.S. were largely relegated to low-wage jobs and the industrialization of the island stalled. So, in reality, what you created was an enclave <laughs> of low wage workers, Puerto Rico no wage workers, in the states. And that was supposed to help the industrialization of Puerto Rico, which sort of happened, but by the 1970s, like all the countries in Latin America, by the way, this is not exclusive to Puerto Rico, who attempted, the name for this in economics is import substitution industrialization, which was attempted in every country, big country in Latin America, even Central America tried it. In the 1970s, it stalled after these first two easy uh, phases of it. So, yes? Explain import substitution. Yes, meaning import substitution industrialization meant that you would replace or substitute what you were imported importing and creating yourself. So Brazil is a good example of a very successful attempt of import substitution industrialization. They create tariffs, close their borders to imports, and begin to bring know-how from the, the technical know-how and the capital from abroad, and they create their own planes, for example, like Embraer. So the reason why Brazil has Embraer planes and people buy them all over the world is because they attempted ISI and Brazil is so big that it's successful because you need scale to be able to have consumption, right, of the good. Because otherwise you don't, you need economies of scale. And if a country like Costa Rica were to try to build a plane, it wouldn't go anywhere. <laughs> uh, because we're too little and there's no market. 
This is why the, the Central American countries created the Central American Common Market to attempt to do this, import substitution industrialization. The thing is, all the countries in Latin America that attempted to do that didn't have this labor surplus valve to send the extra workers from the countryside into another country, right? Legally, Puerto Rico did. But they couldn't make it work because the investment benefits, the taxation benefits, were sunsetted. They were bound to end. And that's why it's stalled? Part of it is stalled, and also because unless you have hit a certain level of industrialization by what is called the third stage, I will put in a slide about that in the presentation. The first two stages are considered the easy ones where growth is supposed to really take off. It's sort of like an engine and momentum. By the time you get to the third difficult stage, the engine of growth is supposed to have taken off so fast that you can make it over the hard parts. Um, most of the, the, what used to be called the Asian tigers attempted this and they succeeded. They went from being rural societies to being industrialized and are supposed to be examples today, right? Most Latin American countries that tried that didn't succeed. Mexico is a good example with cars maybe, um, but it's also assemblage with foreign companies. It's not locally produced autochthonous Mexican cars. Uh, and Brazil. Yes? I wonder if the U.S. sugar industry, in certain states there is a U.S. sugar industry, but the cost of production is so much higher that we pay through not crop support, but crop subsidy mm -hmm. for overpriced sugar mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from our own states. Yeah, yeah corn or beet, right? Pardon? Corn or beet instead of sugar cane. Yeah, or even Hawaiian cane. Right. But I wonder what happened if Puerto Rico was probably never eligible for this crop support. Absolutely not eligible. Absolutely not eligible. And in the Monje Rios book, there is a discussion about how every time there was an attempt to lower the tariffs on Puerto Rican products or try and give some economic breaks to Puerto Rico, the, as I said, the calculations of power in the United States always ended up affecting decisions that had to do with Puerto Rico because the lobbies for the sugar industry in the United States would prevent it from happening. Um, what is interesting, and in, in I think that there's a couple of papers that I um, that deal with the um, with uh, Operation Bootstrap. What is interesting is that the sugar the sugar production economy in Puerto Rico doesn't collapse overnight. The narration seems to make it seems like oh. Operation Bootstrap started in 47 or 48, and by 1950 it was done. It wasn't. It took until the 1960s for it to completely collapse. And there's still production. It's just that with little work and high productivity, they were able to produce without employing so many people. Uh, but the, the rate of how, my, how much they produced, the volume of how much they produced definitely declined. Um, but the, the shape of the Puerto Rican economy changed and the character of, Costa, of Puerto Rico as a country also changed. So um, Puerto Rico moves from agricultural society to a slowly industrializing one. There is a parallel development of moving from a rural to an urban society. Migration is both internal and external to the United States. And as I said at the beginning of the class, in a counterintuitive way, Operation Bootstrap actually created the incentives for increased movement towards the United States because industrialization wasn't happening at the pace that it could cover the losses in the agricultural industry. There is also the creation of a Puerto Rican enclave in the States that would have been smaller had it not been by the combination of these economic policies that were supposed to give Puerto Rico more independence from the United States, part of the idea of transforming the economy was to make Puerto Rico more self-sustaining. 
plus the refusal of the United States to decide what to do with Puerto Rico, right? The reason all of these people end up here is because you have the combination of the two. Um, finally, after Operation Bootstrap, there are two distinct Puerto Rican communities, one in Puerto Rico and one in the United States. And although they are connected culturally with each other, they sort of veer into separate directions. Um, although as we will see during the Maria crisis, the American Puerto Rican community was crucial in getting help for the local Puerto Rican community. Another thing, and then um, Ronald's question, and then we'll go. Um, their context of the Cold War here is very important also, and we haven't mentioned it. And we need to keep it in mind when we have the discussion about the status of Puerto Rico. Once Cuba falls to communism, it cannot be a tourist destination for America's middle classes. And that industry switches to Puerto Rico, changing the economy of Puerto Rico at the same time that bootstrap is happening. It's hard to disaggregate these two, <laughs> right? Number two, it begins to be Puerto Rico is now seen as more important to the United States in strategic terms, not just because of the canal, but because it cannot be risked as falling into the hands of communism. So it is these two things as a, as a safety valve for tourism for America's middle classes to have a near abroad tourist experience, right? Puerto Rico becomes the destination in the Caribbean. It used to be Cuba, it's now Puerto Rico. And number two, it couldn't fall to communism at the height of the Cold War after losing Cuba. So whatever discussion was had in the UN, in the US Congress regarding the future status of Puerto Rico, you cannot have that discussion unless you think of the context of the Cold War. Ronald. You had mentioned it only cost $45. Mm -hmm. In, 19, in 1930s, 1940s, by plane, yes. So was that funded by the government, or was that, that was the price? No, that was the price. Okay. They, I will send you the link to um, PBS on its website, has the full collection of the new Latino Americans, and there's really two episodes that pertain. You have to watch them by bursts, because it's not only about Puerto Rico. Uh, but there's two episodes, one about dreams of empire and one about what are called the new Latinos about Puerto Rico. But there's a story there that I thought was amazing and I will end on this note. Um, and then I'll, I was gonna play a little bit of, um, of um, her winning her Oscar for West Side Story to end on a happy note. But um, when Puerto Ricans come, uh, they have no money, obviously. Uh, they had to invest in coming to to the United States, that $45 to us it sounds, sounds very cheap, but it was an investment. Uh, and the money that they were making wasn't enough, so they would have uh, rent parties. Once a month, they would open their apartment and play music, and people would come and donate some money to come to dance the music and eat the food of their own country, uh, mambo, salsa. And with that, they would make enough money to pay for the rent. And all of this would happen in the Bronx. It, it's a testament of how close the community was. If you, I lived in Washington Heights when I lived in New York for many years, and it's still a very Puerto Rican place. I mean, there have been waves of other immigrants, but it's still very Puerto Rican. Yes? A comment and a question. Uh, as a welfare caseworker I noticed in New York, it was impossible for somebody who's making enough money to pay rent. In New York, it's always impossible to pay rent. <laughs> Yeah. Secondly, you didn't talk about World War II. Was that invisible in Puerto Rico? It wasn't invisible, but I mean, the, the, the issues that we're talking about were frozen because they were at war. There was an understanding. With Puerto, now, think two things here. When did Puerto Ricans become citizens? Right. Immediately they were allowed to, to they, it was done and immediately they, I don't know how many signed up for the army so they could participate in the war effort. So to the nationalist, 
The interpretation is that it was done so that they would have people to participate in the war effort, right? It wasn't done to prevent independence. It was the kind of father, foot right, foot soldiers. Um, but the Puerto Rican politicians in general during the war tried, the focus was on the war. Um, there were still discussions, there were still issues and debates between Puerto Ricans about what was happening, but a, a kind of head to confrontation head to head with the American administration in the middle of war is, wasn't relevant. I mean, again, if you see it sort of from 38 to 45, there is discussion. Winship leaves in 39, and then between 39 and 45, there is a hole in my presentation. And the reason there is a hole in my presentation is because there is almost like a, an agreement that nothing could be decided because of the war. Just a second. The thing that is important is after the war, as the language of self-determination from the United States, from the European countries, begins to take center stage in the formation of the United Nations, it becomes untenable, as I said, for the United States to say to Puerto Rico, you don't have a right to decide your future. While from the, sorry, from one side of their mouth, they're talking about self-determination, and from the other side of their mouth, they're saying, oh, but not you. Yes. Were Puerto Rican men uh, subject to the draft in World War II? Yeah. Yeah, they participated, I mean, once they became citizens. There is an interesting discussion, this, this is sort of parallel to this, there is an interesting discussion about how citizenship would be awarded in 1917. And the discussion was, will it be a mass naturalization? I bestow you with citizenship, or would it be a, an individual process? So they opted for mass bestowing of the citizenship and that Puerto Ricans who didn't want to be citizens could apply not to be citizens. Uh, the number was very small. And then there was a debate if the people who wanted to not be citizens could actually participate in politics in the island. Um, there were cases where um, because of what the Jones Act said that officials had to be citizens, Teachers in high schools and elementary schools who had opted not to become citizens were fired from their jobs. Um, this was challenged in court, though, um, although the Office of Insular Affairs never really paid attention to the decision of the court. Um, that, was, uh, that kept being a problem. Um, the other thing that is important here, and I will touch on it, it's a bit controversial, is um, the, the program of mass sterilization uh, of women in Puerto Rico that were not voluntary, that was together or, or parallel to the bootstrap program. As I noted, most of the workers in factories were women, um, and women who could have children were not seen as ideal workers, so part of the program in bootstrap was to incentivize, I hate that word, but I'll use it, um, sterilization. Um, and there is questions about how voluntary these sterilizations were and how transparent the doctors providing them were. Um, this feels a little bit like a conspiracy theory because if you read on it on the internet, um, most of the data I found uh, was really from websites you wouldn't want to touch with a foot pole. But I did find an academic paper on it that did um, really fantastic research and I will start our discussion next week on that. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you.